Hello, everyone. I think we can um, get started. So, hi, everyone. Thanks for giving me the time to talk about um, Active Directory Certificate Services. Um, let's get started. So, maybe a little bit about myself. Um, I asked ChatGPT to um, summarize my um, bio and everything. But I am one of those consultants that do many consulting things um, for cybersecurity. I like both red and blue teaming, so I guess that makes me purple. Um, and I really have a passion for teaching, um, which is why I get involved at the University of Pretoria and try Hack Me as well, um, sort of like helping engineering students and helping people learn about cybersecurity. Um, I also sort of, as I mentioned, generated it with ChatGPT, and I think it's slightly narcissistic, so um, when I have time, it's probably time to rewrite that bio again. Um, but before we dive into the wonderful world of ADCS, I think first we need to sort of cover a little bit of ground. Um, I am a fan of leaving no man behind, so let's get a little bit of the background um, and let's cover that before we dive into the technicalities of this talk. So why Active Directory? Why is Active Directory sort of revered by both the blue and red teamers alike? And why do red teamers attempt to scale the mountain that is AD and why is blue teamers trying to make this journey as perilous as possible? Well, it's really actually simple in the sense that most organizations, um, last time I checked it was about 90% of the Forbes 1000 companies make use of Active Directory. And Active Directory basically controls access to everything. So as a red teamer, if you can scale the mountain and you make it to that tippy top, you become a domain admin, then you have the ability to either directly authenticate to whatever you want to, or you would have the ability to get to a position where you can compromise whatever asset you need to compromise. But beware, here be monsters and traps for the same reason that this is the challenge that every red teamer wants to accomplish. It's the same reason why the blue teamers are protecting it so fiercely. So this creates a constant tug of war between your red and your blue team. And usually we find that that game has quite a bit of balance to it, um, which is then why when we get something where a red team essentially has a teleport scroll to get to the top, it's quite big news, right? It's quite something that is going to upset that balance that we have for this game. So, what does a typical AD structure look like in an organization? Well, if it's built several years ago, it's probably Pandora's box, but that's an entirely different talk for a different day. But in Active Directory, we talk about forests. So what is going to happen is let's sort of take a look at what this forest is going to look like. We'll start with our first domain, which is going to be our thm.log domain. In this domain, we have the domain controllers and servers, but let's say that our organization is so large that it's either sort of distinct regions or big subsidiaries. Rather than dumping everything into a single domain, what we will do is we will essentially create children. So we can have the za.thm.log domain as a sub or a child domain that is serving all of the South African resources. We have all of our wonderful servers and our computers are living within that ZA domain. And we are not restricted to just one child. We can create as many children as we possibly want. And each of those children is going to serve resources that is specific to that child domain. And this then creates the entire THM forest. Microsoft says that the security boundary sits at the forest. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But we can also have other forests here as well. And there are ways for us to establish trust between these various different forests as well. So this is basically the structure that Active Directory looks like. We have all of these different forests. Within the forest, what is going to happen is that because it is a child domain, there will automatically be intrinsic trust between the child and the parent. So that's a bi-directional um, trust that is created there. And now, while there might not be direct trust between two of the children, 
because they have both have trust with the parent, there's intrinsic trust between those two child domains as well. And then, of course, when you're configuring other trust with other forests, there's different ways that you can do it, but it's either both trust each other or only one trusts the other. But this is what it looks like when we are building a Active Directory forest. Now, the last bit of background to sort of cover is what is Active Directory Certificate Services? So AD knows that if you're making it in the big league, you have to diversify. And that's why they don't just provide you with identity and access management, but they have a lot of what I call sort of sub-services or special services or tack-on services that they are going to give you access to. Um, a popular one in the past is something like Exchange for mail functionality, or I'm going to call it SCCM. I know it has the new name of MECM, but no one seems to use that. So SCCM, which is for patch and update management. And ADCS, Active Directory Certificate Services, is similar in the sense that it is a sub-service and it allows you to create your own internal certificate authority. So while you want to have an external CA for everything that you're exposing on your perimeter, right, to verify for your clients that there's trust, you can't necessarily use an external CA for all of your internal systems. So that is where ADCS is coming to play. It's public key infrastructure that can be used to create an internal CA um, to do all of the encryption needs that you have within your organization. So basically, ADCS is going to integrate into AD, and it then allows us to create what we call an enterprise CA. So the keyword here is enterprise, and we'll talk a little bit about that because the fact is that this is an enterprise service, and often we might not understand or really realize what it means when you are creating an enterprise service, such as Exchange is an enterprise service. So what is actually meant by this word of enterprise? And for today, we are going to do a little bit of a dive into that as well. So then, before we start our dive, we're sort of just having a quick recap of the terms, and then sort of the last two bits of terms that are important to talk about. The first one is going to be Kerberos, which is one of the big protocols that AD uses for authentication. The short of it is that it allows you to get a ticket, and this ticket gives you access to the ride that is called AD. And then lastly, that ADCS, if a certificate is used for authentication, there's two methods that that can happen. The first one is PK init, which the short of it means that it's Kerberos authentication that it's using with a certificate. But there is also a different authentication protocol that we can use, which is called S-channel, um, and it's most popular with something like LDAP-S. So we're authenticating to LDAP using a certificate. It goes through S-channel authentication. So with all of that covered, let's dive into it. So in 2021, finally Active Directory Certificate Services came under scrutiny um, because of the opportunities that it provides for threat actors for credential theft and for domain and forest privilege escalation. So the thing is, is that normally all of us focuses on AD, rightfully so, right? It's the big thing. Um, but it means that these side services of AD don't get the same type of attention. And often what happens is when a researcher starts to dive a little bit under the hood, they start to see quite a bit of bad things. So this happened in 2021 when the researchers from Spectre Ops looked under the hood, and they were fairly surprised by what they found. So it is worth noting that there's a distinguishing factor between a vulnerability and a misconfiguration. Um, so in AD, we don't normally say that it's a vulnerability. It's just purely a misconfiguration. Someone changed the configuration to something that it shouldn't be. Um, and while sort of the road to hell is paved with good intentions, it is almost as if AD makes it too easy to misconfigure something. I think they, they need like a klaxon and a lot of red alert alarms going off when some people click like just one text box and there you go, you've added the domain users to domain admins. Um, you would think they would sort of like realize that these things are bad and give you sufficient warning there. And the same can be said to ADCS to a certain degree. So when you first install it, it's not vulnerable. That's also a lie. We'll discuss a actual vulnerability that we found with ADCS. but. Um, it's worth noting that it's technically not vulnerable, right, from the start. And then what happens is, based on the configurations that users are going to do, that's when it becomes vulnerable. So 
See, Microsoft needs those big warning labels. I don't know if any of you can spot the warning label on that image there. But if you, if you look slightly closer there, it will say that if you want an enterprise CA, the account you're specifying there must be an enterprise admin. That's the warning. That's all you get, right? Warning you that this is an enterprise level service that you are installing. So it's literally that only tiny note that you're getting that's telling you that you are dabbling now with enterprise services here. And here be dragons, you need to be careful. Now, you can go for the top option, which is a standalone CA, but I promise you no one will ever do that. And the reason for it is if you install a standalone CA, nothing trusts it. Like nothing at all will trust the standalone CA, where if you just click the second option, enterprise CA, then it means that Microsoft is dealing with all of the nice intricacies of making sure that everything in your domain trusts that CA. It will do all of that configuration for you automatically. But it's an enterprise service. So what does that sort of mean for us here is what we are going to dive into it. But the short answer is that when you are installing an enterprise service, that needs to happen within the parent domain, right? Your children can have a sip of the permissions every now and then, but this is for the adults, right? And a lot of times what can happen, and we have actually seen that on client estates, is that something like this gets installed in a child domain. And that is horrifically wrong. Um, and we'll go through why that is really, really bad in a minute. But understand this is an enterprise service, which means we should treat it as such. So this then tells us everything that we need to know if ADCS is an enterprise service, the same category as things like Exchange and ACCM, then it means that if we can compromise ADCS, we can take full control of the entire forest. But there's even a lot more scary details under the hood as well. See, if AD, apologies, skipped ahead there. So if ADCS is misconfigured, then this is going to be the thing that becomes that teleport scroll. Normal conventional AD attacks, there's quite a lot of things that you need to do to be able to compromise um, systems and finally take full control of the forest. With ADCS, if there's one misconfigured template, this is your jump directly to enterprise admins. So the main user to enterprise admin is something that we've seen quite a lot now, and we're not even talking about conventional things like golden ticket attacks. It's a one-hop thing, and the part that makes it the most scary for me as well is that we can literally use internal tooling for that. You can use Microsoft's legitimate functionality to perform this exploit, and it will work. The other thing with this as well is that it has built-in persistence. Um, certificates are impervious to credential rotation. So for example, if a user account is compromised, the blue team, the first thing they're going to do is rotate those credentials. Certificates persist through those credential rotations because you're no longer using the user's password for your persistence, you're persisting with a certificate. So as long as that certificate's valid, that's how long you have persistence. If you compromise a root CA, that is 10 years of persistence that you have, unless they rotate the root CA, um, which is wild to do, to invalidate every single certificate in your entire organization. Um, and what we are seeing here as well is because the attack surface is different, it means that detection and response is still catching up. Um, we don't have that same maturity in the detection that we need with our conventional AD attacks. So, before we dive into ADCS exploitation, I want to gather around all the children for a story of back in my day, um, when um, the young hipsters are getting EA, for us it was quite a number of steps that we had to go through. So what did sort of cross the main lateral movement really look like? Well, um, if you were lucky enough, you would land up in one of the child domains through a social engineering attack, a web drive-by, or maybe there's no network access control in an office, but that finally gets you into one of these child domains. And what you would do is you would rummage through that child domain, compromising a bunch of things, being noisy, um, or trying not to be noisy, but trying to compromise until finally you have the ability to compromise that child domain. Once you have compromised that child domain, the next thing if you wanted to move to the other child domains would be that you would have to compromise the parent. 
So we would use conventional attacks such as a Kerberos golden ticket attack. In today's time, we have things which the detections of is slightly less, such as a diamond or a sapphire ticket. But we have to target a parent, compromise the parent, and once we have control of the parent, we can bully our siblings and finally take control of them as well. And then once we have control of the parent, at that point, we can also look to move to other forests where there are trusts as well. So, to show a little demo of what this looks like, I'm running this from the domain controller. Um, you don't have to do it from the domain controller. That's probably going to flag quite a bit. But what we're going to do is we're going to do a golden ticket attack. So first, what we're doing is we're getting some security identifiers, some information that we need to craft our golden ticket attack. And one of the things that flags a lot is you need access to the KRB TGT hash. And um, that's the hash that's used to sign all Kerberos tickets. So we need that hash, which means that we need to dump it from one of the child domain controllers. Um, you can see we um, are running Mimikatz on a domain controller, which will 100% flag. There are other ways of getting that information, but it is a tried and tested path, which means from a detection standpoint, it's also a tried and tested way of detecting these type of attacks that are happening. And you can see what we did there is using Mimikatz as well. We generated a golden ticket. Ticket, and we can see that with that golden ticket now loaded into our Kerberos tickets, we have access to the parent um, domain in this case. We can then um, run something like PSExec, also something that will flag quite hard, but um, um, I don't have any detection in this lab. So we're going to run PSExec if I can remember how to type the command. Um, this is a video, so I did figure it out somewhere. Um, and that's going to allow us to basically now move to that parent domain controller. So we're asking for CMD to execute. It's going to activate the PS exec. That's going to give us a lovely additional detection there as well. Um, with your root domain controller and the parent all of a sudden allowing PS exec as a service. Um, and then once we have access to that, what is interesting to see is that that Kerberos ticket goes with us. So um, when we type, for example, a command like who am I, it still sees us as the child administrator. But remember, the Kerberos ticket is the thing that's the golden ticket that's giving us access. And this is now passing through sort of to the other child domain controllers as well, allowing us to compromise them as well. So what does this look like from an ADCS perspective? So if we don't want to go the conventional route, what do we need to do if we want to perform lateral movement through ADCS? Well, there's, there's three main steps that we need to do. The first step is that we need to hunt for template permissions. So we need to hunt for a misconfigured template that can be used by us for privilege escalation or lateral movement. Um, we need to look for templates where the ownership has been misconfigured. So, for example, sometimes we don't have the ability to request the template that we want, um, but we do have the ability to compromise a user that's the owner of a template. And while that template might not have been misconfigured, if we are now the owner of that template, we can just misconfigure that template ourselves and make it vulnerable. So that's another way that we can go for it. We also want to sort of like create a privileged account to authenticate. So we want to make sure that we are escalating our privileges. So we don't want to authenticate as our user, but we want to impersonate someone of privileged access. Um, or we can also just look to basically compromise the ADCS server itself directly. It is a server. If there's misconfigurations around who can access it, who is an administrator on that server, if we can compromise the entire ADCS server, we can just do whatever we want there as well. But we're looking for template permissions, something that's wrong there. Once we get into the right position, we can then generate a certificate. Um, and the three main ways of doing this is we can use the built-in Windows tool. So this is an attack that you can run completely with native tooling. Um, or what we would do is we can generate a certificate signing request and then send that for web enrollment. This is a popular legitimate functionality that is used, for example, for Linux machines to get a certificate for them. You generate the CSR, you take it to the ADCS website, and you enroll and you get a certificate from there. But we can look to abuse that as well. Or we can use specialized tooling such as Certify to generate that certificate for us. And then once we have that certificate, that is basically it. We're ready to authenticate. And our two options that we're going for there is PK in it, which is going to be Kerberos authentication or S-channel authentication, which allows us to authenticate to LDAP on a domain controller. So 
hunting for the certificate. Just to prove it, you can use 100% native tooling. So you can use something like Cert Utor, which is built in on Windows to get the certificate template. And while those security descriptors are quite ugly and needs to be sort of decoded, you can 100% decode those security descriptors and do this completely from a native perspective. Um, fortunately, things like Certify makes that a lot easier. It allows us to use tooling to do that enumeration. And one thing why I'm a big, big, big fan of Certify is it allows you to get that data in a format that's supported within Bloodhound. So that now means you can take your Sharphound data, combine it with your Certify data, and all of a sudden you can draw those nice little Bloodhound graphs that tells you this user has access to this permission, or this is an escalation vector um, that the following users can access. So we can then draw attack paths to get us into the position where we can use ADCS. Now, with that being said, what are we looking for? Um, there's actually quite a number of things that Spectre Ops published for us. The first thing is misconfigured templates. So according to the Spectre Ops white paper, these are the escalation routes that they make available, which is escalation one to three, and nine is when a template itself has been misconfigured and you can use it. We also hunt for misconfigured template permissions. As mentioned before, even if a template's not vulnerable, if we can take ownership of that template, we can make it vulnerable ourselves. Um, we're also looking for misconfigured Active Directory. So still the same type of attacks apply if Active Directory itself has been um, misconfigured, we can leverage that to get in a position where we can use ADCS. And often where we see that as well is sort of a misconfigured ADCS server, um, which allows us to compromise the server. If we can compromise the server, we have the opportunity to, for example, pull the root certificate or create other templates that might be vulnerable, and we can use that for our ADCS attacks. Um, ADCS itself can also be misconfigured, so then we can run some interesting attacks such as Petit Pretam, where we're trying to do a relay to get a certificate via web enrollment because it does support um, non-encrypted communication. Um, and we are looking for misconfigured domain controllers as well. So a very interesting one that was done by Oliver Lyak, I hope I'm saying that right, the creator of Certify, was that CVE that he found where if the domain controller itself was misconfigured, not having the security patch, you could abuse that to basically generate a certificate for any domain controller, which is a privileged system in the environment, and then use that for your future attacks. Now, I will be focusing on just escalation one for um, this demonstration because it is the simplest one. So for escalation one, we just have to ask ourselves a couple of questions in our enumeration phase. The first part is, can I request the certificate template or can I get into a position where I will have the ability to request that specific template? If that's a yes, we're one step closer. Then does that certificate template need manager approval or sort of need any digital signatures? The only reason that's important is there's then another human step. Someone's going to review what we're doing. If that's not there, it doesn't mean, if it's there, it doesn't mean we cannot do it. It just means that we need to look out for another human there, um, which is going to be a little bit harder. So if that's not there, ticket, we're one step closer. Then, does that certificate template support a authentication EKU? So that's extended key usage. We are looking for the client authentication one because we want to use the certificate to authenticate as a client and as a privileged client, like the administrator. And then lastly, does it allow you to specify the subject alternative name? Because if it allows us to specify that, rather than specifying a SAN, what we're going to do is we're going to specify a user principal name of a very privileged account, allows us to generate a certificate for that user and then authenticate as them. So quickly showing what that looks like from the native perspective, we can open Management Console. Um, as promised, you can do this completely native by just loading in certificates here. And what we're going to do is we are going to use the native built-in tooling to request a certificate that is going to be vulnerable. So we tell it we want to request a new certificate because this is an enterprise CA. What happens is all those policies and those wonderful things are pulled in for us. We can see the one that is vulnerable there. And we can see that rather than specifying the SAN, what it's expecting um, for the first one, we're just going to 
specify whatever we want. But for the second one, for the alternative name, what we're going to do is specify the user principal name of the administrator. So at this point, we have a certificate where the user principal name is the administrator, which means that we can now use the certificate for very privileged things. Um, the one thing that's important is for us to use the certificate in other locations, the private key needs to be exportable. And while that is template configuration, it's client-side template configuration, so we can just click the button to make the private key exportable ourselves. After providing the information that we need, that is successful enrollment. And as you can see there, we have a lovely vulnerable certificate now that will allow us to authenticate as the administrator. Um, and as we can see through its things, um, we can then do a export of that certificate as well. So I'll stop it here. Um, there we go. So now let's look at what this looks like if we were going to do Certify, for example, a lot easier. So with this one, what we are going to do is we use Certify to first perform enumeration. We give it a AD account. It's going to perform enumeration for us. Save it to um, JSON and text file in this case. We're just going to look through the text file. And what we will note is we'll see that on that web server vulnerable, we can see that that is a vulnerable template. And the reason for it is, is we can provide the SAN, enrollee supplies subject. We can see that there's client authentication, and we can see the enrollment rights currently allows all domain users or domain computers to enroll for the certificate template. And we can see that Certify also tells us that this is a vulnerable template that it can be used for privilege escalation. So basically all we're going to do at this point is we are going to run a Certify command to request that certificate. And as you can see, the UPN that we are specifying here is the administrator of that child domain. Once we get that certificate, we can use it for authentication. And what we will see here is that Certify also then, just as an added bonus, gives us the hash of that specific user. But we will see that our authentication works. And the big important part is we get a Kerberos ticket here. So that Kerberos ticket is now for the administrator user, and it can be used. So wonderful. Now, let's see what it looks like if we are going to do lateral movement across this entire forest using something like Certify. So instead of specifying that we are the user principal of administrator at za.mwr.loc, what happens if we specify we're the administrator at mwr.loc? We want to be the administrator of the parent domain. Well, if we do that, then we'll see it says PA data no support. Um, and the reason for that is we'll dive into it, like what's actually happening here, but it's because that domain controller doesn't have a Kerberos certificate, which allows it to support PK in it. But as you will note here, we can then just still do LDAP authentication to that parent domain controller. There's some lovely commands you can run. Um, Oliver also clickbaits you with a nice dump command for dumping the domain. And then when you try it, it just says not implemented. But in essence, it is working at this point for us to target the parent domain controller. But there's a step further here. We don't need to target the parent domain. In this case, what happens if we just get a certificate directly for the other child domain, for that domain controller? Well, that works. And what you'll note here is the same issue is going to happen on that child domain controller in a different domain, is that it doesn't support PK in it. And the reason, again, is there's no Kerbero certificate. But for some reason, we can still do LDAP authentication. We can still do S-channel authentication to that one. And as you'll note, we are now authenticated as the administrator in the other child domain. So at this point, for some reason, we don't need to compromise the parent. We can go directly for the other child domain that we are looking for. So what is actually happening here? Well, um, after doing a little bit of inspection, we can see that for some reason, the domain controller in every single domain in the entire forest has a domain controller certificate. Um, why? Why has this happened? And that's default configuration from ADCA. So once you just click through those buttons of configuration, every single one of your domain controllers is going to enroll, not for a Kerberos um, um, certificate that can be used for PK in it, but for a domain controller certificate. Um, and what's worse is, is if you think the answer is to delete that certificate, 
um, the only sad reality is we can see it's proper, proper deleted every single time group policy updates, which is 15 minutes standard on a domain controller, that little bugger is coming back. Um, I'm still to find the actual group policy object that does the enrollment of that certificate, but it happens. So every 15 minutes there's a check that's happening and if that domain controller does not have a domain controller certificate, it will be back there. And this is normal configuration from Windows. So again, while we cannot do Kerberos authentication, if we can perform LDAP authentication in any of the other domains, I hope you see how we've literally gone from domain user in a simple child domain, not just to enterprise admin, but we can skip enterprise admin entirely and compromise another child domain if we choose so. Now it gets worse. So then this sent us on a rabbit hole of trying to figure out what is actually happening here. Um, and I hope it become, it's clear there, but what was very interesting to see is for this ADCS instance, we installed it in the parent domain. We followed the configuration, we did it correctly. And for some reason, when we view the containers that gets created when ADCS is configured, we noticed that the administrators in the child domain had full control over those containers. Now, Microsoft promises you this is an enterprise service, right? Which means parent domain, enterprise admins, they should be the only ones that have this permission. But for some reason, in every single one of your child domains, your child administrators have access to those containers. So if those are the containers that tells you what the configuration of ADCS is, and a child domain has access full control to those containers, it will lead to some interesting privilege escalation attacks that we can perform here, even if the organization followed all of the rules, made sure to control all of the templates, everything of ADCS from the parent domain, we can still do privilege escalation. It gets worse if someone decided to install ADCS directly in a child domain, because then it's not just the administrators of the child domain that have full control, but now a group that is a little bit more easy to get than that built-in administrator group, which is the domain admins as well. So what is actually happening here to result in this misconfiguration that even if you follow Microsoft's guidance that this is an enterprise service, they are giving permissions for child domains as well. And looking at the ACLs, the very, very interesting thing that we noticed is that they, someone was a little bit lazy at Microsoft, and instead of specifying the administrators of a specific domain, they specified the permission of built-in administrators. Now that shouldn't be an issue, but can anyone spot the difference there when we view those containers from a child domain and from a parent domain. What's happening is that built-in administrators is interpreted from the domain that you are viewing the permissions. Remember, these containers, for any forest, there's only one set of these containers and it gets replicated to every domain controller in the domain, but there's only one set. It only lives in the parent domain. But for some reason, the built-in administrator's permission, that built-in word, if you are viewing the containers from a child domain, it says you, the administrators of the child domain, has full control over those containers. And when you view those same containers from the parent domain, now it's saying, no, 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 it's the parent administrators that have full control here. So we have a privilege escalation vector here. If we compromise the administrators group from a child domain, because of the misinterpretation of the built-in administrator's ACE, we can now privilege escalate. We can take full control of containers that should be in the parent domain. So we did just that. We weaponized it. Um, and what we did is we created a PowerShell script. So here you will see we are generating our own fake CA, um, just using OpenSSL to create the key for our CA. And once we have that public key, what we are going to do is we are then going to move that public key to a Windows system. And on the Windows system, what we are going to do is run our script, provide it with that public key. This is in the child domain. 
So we're providing the script our public key. And what this is going to do is it's now going to take that public key and embed it in very specific containers within the ADCS configuration. The first place we embed it is going to be an NT auth certificate, right? Which means that this certificate is trusted for authentication. Um, that's not the last step of this thing. And the reason for that is, is you also need to make your CA a trusted CA. But surprise, if they installed ADCS, there's a AD certificate authority there. And the same vulnerability is on that container where a child domain has the ability to tamper with that object. And as you can see, our fake CA made its way all the way to the parent domain. It is now a trusted CA that we have embedded in the parent domain, essentially the entire forest after compromising one of the childs. And again, what you will see here is if we try to do Kerberos authentication, no PK in at support, but LDAP authentication works. So what we have done now is we have embedded our very own fake CA with a certificate that's valid for 10 years that allows us to generate any malicious certificate that we want. And because we're in control of that CA, there's no certification revocation list. They can't revoke these certificates. Um, and we have the ability to perform LDAP authentication to any domain within this forest. So quite an interesting one. So we reported it to Microsoft. Um, this slide was called a word from our sponsor, but I was not allowed to put that in. I can still mention it. Um, and essentially, the issue that Microsoft came up with is they basically said that, well, the security boundary sits at the forest. We do not see privilege escalation from a child domain to the parent domain as real privilege escalation. I think they're just getting tired of golden ticket attacks and all of those things. But essentially, what they told us is, nope, the boundary sits at the forest, so there's no real privilege escalation that has happened here. But what it allows us to do now is if they are making use of ADCS and they're doing everything correctly, if you have the ability to compromise a single child domain, at that point, that is privilege escalation and persistence in one hop that allows you to compromise the entire forest at this point. Embedding your own CA in that forest, which means that they can't even revoke the malicious certificates that you have created at this point. Um, since we are nice, nicer than Microsoft, sorry, it's a little bit small, but um, the same script that does the weaponization for you, we have actually embedded a function that allows you to scan your um, containers to see if you're vulnerable to this type of thing. And if you are vulnerable to it because it's really not that hard, um, you shouldn't be using your built-in administrator group for anything, especially in the parent domain. Um, you can run the same script um, with another function to basically remove the bad permission at this point. Um, and as you can see, we are now clean. And when we run our exploit from the child domain, it's going to tell us, well, we don't have the permissions to do this. So there you'll see when we are loading our malicious certificate, we get some lovely errors there telling us that permission denied. We cannot load the CA from a child domain controller anymore. Um, so we did release the tool as well. If anyone wants to play around with it, there you go. It is public officially um, from today, including the blog post that explains this issue as well. Um, as I mentioned, the script can help you as a raid team if you want to embed persistence. We do also tell you where to remove your persistence because once you embed this, this is forest-wide compromise for that certificate. Um, any client you do a raid team for is going to have to um, have a stern conversation with you to remove that persistence once you're done. Um, but in essence, once you compromise one child, that is essentially the entire forest falling, allowing you to embed your CA at this point. So, Quickly to wrap up, what does it look like from a detection perspective? Um, I think prevention is still better than detection. Um, and there the trick is that you really need to treat ADCS like the enterprise service that it is. If you decided to install ADCS or configure it within a child domain, I highly recommend you move it out. And I know that's quite hard because that means you need to move that private key and that certificate and everything. But this shouldn't be something that lives in any of your child domains. Um, if you have installed it in a child domain, if you've given any permissions um, for any of your templates to any of the child domain um, users, 
you have essentially made them enterprise admins at this point. Um, and I know that's tough because it means someone centrally has to manage all certificate templates for this AD that has like 12 distinct regions and child domains, but that's what needs to happen. If you grant permissions within any of those child domains for ADCS, you have created new enterprise admins in your organization. So that is the best option is to prevent it. What we can do is we can also detect unknown tooling and indicators of compromise. We can look for things like Certify, Rubia, Certify. These are the tooling that would be used with ADCS compromises. But I think as I've shown you as well, you can just use the native tooling. So detection on the tooling alone is not going to be enough. That then leads us to try to perform detection on authentication. But this is where things can get hard because Kerberos authentication is quite noisy in an environment that's being used everywhere. So hopefully what we can do for those cross-domain lateral movement techniques is do a little bit more detection on LDAP itself. So what are some of the event IDs we can look for? Um, the first one we can look for things where sort of like altering of a certificate request extension changes. So is someone modifying templates, are they doing some bad stuff there? Um, as I mentioned, we can look for changes in ADCS is one of the things that we can monitor on. Um, we can also look for things like a certificate has been issued. Depending on your organization, how often certificates are issued, that might be a detection thing um, to implement. And as mentioned, one of the things that we can look at is the authentication itself. Kerberos is going to be very noisy, but we might be able to sort of do detections on, for example, administrator Kerberos tickets, which is a built-in account that we should not be using at this point. And then we can look for the logon event that is telling us that S-channel authentication has occurred. And um, that's another way that we can look to detect it. And then in sort of just closing on it, um, I do think that we have as a red team currently a teleport scroll allowing us to move not just within a domain, but essentially within an entire forest um, quite fast. And that the detection game for ADCS exploits definitely needs to catch up. This is the new sort of golden ticket attacks that we need to look out for. And this is the things that we need to sort of upskill our detection in and make sure that we are doing custom freight hunting for this as well. And then for those in Hexcon, the, the watch this space was because we didn't do the full weaponization by the Hexcon conference. But it's still here, and the reason for it is um, we were lucky enough to find this built-in administrator misconfiguration within ADCS. But there's a lot of other containers there. There's a lot of other services. And it seems that Microsoft says it's acceptable that when someone uses the built-in administrator ACE, that there is allowed to be confusion between whether that's something within the parent domain or whether it's something within the child domain, which means that this privilege escalation vector most likely exists in other tooling as well that is performing configuration on containers. Um, and if that container has the built-in administrator, um, probably in trouble. It means that's now a child domain has the ability to take full control of that container. And then lastly, just a couple of acknowledgements for the previous research by Spectre Ops and Oliver Lyak. Really love his Certify tool. It really makes your life a lot easier. And for MWR and for TriHackMe for building large labs in AWS and raising the AWS bill. Um, and then Al Hazred, um, a Twitch streamer. He was streaming my Red Team Capstone Challenge and that's where we found this initial thing that you can just do lateral movement to any other child domain and sent me on this rabbit hole for ADCS investigation. Thanks. Any questions? Yes. Really, really hard to keep them together. 
Absolutely. Um, it's really, really a hard thing. The best AD is no AD or a fresh AD. <laughs> Um, uh, the amount of times we've gone on assessments and you enumerate 80 and you can see this, this dumpster fire and then you see this new 80 that was created and it looks all shiny and then, guys, this is really good and like no one uses it. We're still like 10 years in the development of migrating to this magical 80 um, that is secure. So Active Directory, certific um, Active Directory itself is really, really hard to do well. Um, and I am a little bit angered by, for example, Microsoft's responses to certain things where it's like, this is something basic, guys. Like, just remove this one permission or just change this one thing. And the answer you get from them is like, nope, not, not our problem, not our problem. Like, protect your entire forest. And if you're a small organization, that's, that's easier to do. But when you're one of these large organizations that have like 13 different regions across the world with different child domains, I mean, I'm asking you to manage ADCS from the parent domain. And that's probably not even feasible, right? Um, so there has to be a different way, but it feels like Microsoft's not always coming to the party. Yes. That is correct. So what would happen is there's two different configurations. I hope and pray you followed the manual approach, because if you did, you're not vulnerable. But if you followed Microsoft's neat little commands they tell you to run, then it's doing container replication between the two forests. And if that happens, remember, as soon as I make this change to this container, it replicates to the other forest as well, which means cross-forest privilege escalation and lateral movement has just become a possibility. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, probably a bit of a new question because I don't really know any of that well. But um, I was saying one of the things that you were doing earlier is you were getting the template to execute a command to stop the template. Is that like a, is there a legitimate reason to be, to be doing that? Or is that, is that something that should be like a Yara rule or like it's a, maybe even bad? Like no one should be executing that. Sure. Um, you definitely, so, so templates are the way that ADCS allows you to grant your users the permissions to request certificates. So that's intended behavior. There are template misconfigurations. So for example, you should never have a template that allows for client authentication and allows the specifying of the subject alternative name. Microsoft even pops up a tiny little warning to say like, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Um, and you just click through it and there you go, you have a vulnerable template. Where the issue comes in is what is not intended behavior but sometimes happens is it's not this one central group that manages all of the templates. A child domain, the users there need access to certain certificate templates. So there will be a group that's granted access over those templates. And this is the interesting part where you're mixing conventional AD compromises with ADCS compromises. Now I don't need to get to domain admins. I just need to get to the group in AD that has the permissions to modify certificate templates. Because even if the template's not vulnerable, I myself can just make it vulnerable. That's where your detection comes in on has any of your templates been altered. Um, those event IDs become quite important to monitor for. Because again, I can just, if no template's vulnerable, I can just make my own vulnerable template if I have those permissions. Yes. Any other? Yes.
take it is that in larger states, it'll probably be irritating to somebody to continuously provide management uh, responses to, uh, is this the correct set, uh, send for this web server or whatever this specific instance is, which I think is pro probably part of the reason why you end up having uh, certificates where it doesn't matter, you will just uh, select the send and then you have that, or you're given full write permissions, and either one of those two is literally just game over. Yeah, it's it's tough. And again, the, the issue here is, is this is one of the most clear-cut cases where security is fighting against business use. There's other places where it happens as well, but this is the one where I can understand why people misconfigure it, but they, they need to be aware that the misconfiguration they're doing there is allowing people to be enterprise admins. So probably shouldn't do it, but who am I to complain if I'm holding up your business um, and everything like that? It's <laughs> tough. Anything else? Yes. Uh, this lateral movement, if you've got a, uh, say, a Fortune 500 company, 13 channels, I mean, this kind of lateral uh, escalation allows you to pr break well, uh, responsibility boundaries. So each child domain is generally self governed, and you're getting someone. Absolutely. And, and that's the trick here is I don't think we pay enough attention when Microsoft gives that tiny warning, this is enterprise level, right? Like I can't fault anyone for having their child domains install ADCS, but it's really bad. You've literally promoted that child domain to a parent domain. That's what you've done. Not possible. I don't know any large multinational that operates like that unless it was by accident. Thank you. I think I'm officially out of time. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>